Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon. My name is Paul, and I'm an adult husband of a grateful member of Al-Anon. <laughs> I don't think Alamans ought to be allowed to tell dumb jokes like that. Uh, the, uh, I, uh, like Max, I don't tell jokes either. I, not, I, mainly because I can't remember, remember jokes. I mean, that, that's not really true. I can remember any joke, but then I have to give up one of the other two that I remember. It, uh, I, uh, I have, I know a poem though. You want, you want to hear my poem? I think, I think you'd hear it no matter what you'd said, but I, <laughs> you know, I, I'm uh, not very cultured. I know one poem and, uh, well, it's a real good poem too. Uh, very, uh, very appropriate. Uh, how does it go? Uh, Oh, the, the whiskey was spilled on the bar room floor, and the bar was closed for the night. A little gray mouse crept out of his hole to dance in the pale moonlight. He lapped up the whiskey on the bar room floor, and back on his haunches he sat. And all night long, you could hear him roar, bring on that goddamn cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could tell by looking at you, you were the cultural type of people. I knew you liked the finer things here in San Francisco. Hadn't this been a great weekend so far? Yeah. Good. Good news is most everybody's had a good time. Bad news is, if it ha- uh, the bad news is, if you haven't, it's your own damn fault. Yeah. <laughs> and attitude is just about everything. And uh, as a matter of fact, this being the last meeting of the whole weekend, it's uh, by the power vested in me as your last speaker, I um, pronounce all of you charter members of the Spirit of San Francisco. <laughs> What, what that entitles you to is uh, <laughs> free entrance to uh, every hospitality room hereafter. And it also obligates you to come back every year and bring all your friends. And, uh, so it just keeps getting better and better. It's a lot of work to do something like this, especially the first time. It reminded me, in fact, opening the meeting with the uh, serenity prayer reminded me of a meeting I uh, went to in another state. It was a fundraiser. It was uh, about this time of the day on a Saturday. Uh, it was a one-day event. And what they had was a chartered uh, meal at noon on Saturday. They had had it uh, one year before, and it uh, turned out well for them. They had 150 people in attendance, and they decided to do it again this next year. And... Uh, but at the last minute, the people that were putting on got uh, a resentment. Uh, you know what a resentment is, I forget. Uh, and they decided they wouldn't do it. They called it off. And they ended it. And another group decided, uh, no, they can't do that to us. Uh, we'll form our own committee, and we'll put it on. And by God, we'll have 300 people. And they worked real hard. They got the thing set up, and they got the thing going. And they were so successful that uh, instead of having 300, they had 500 people. Well, what that did was to throw a strain on the caterer who wasn't prepared for that, so it made a delay in the meal. And the other thing that happened was that they had invited the local minister to give the invocation, and he hadn't shown up. 
So I went to one of the old timers, and they said, if the, if the minister doesn't show up, will you get up and give the invocation? He said, well, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, all right. And he started making some notes as to what he would say. And uh, the caterer kept working and working, and the guy kept writing notes about the invocation. And finally, the caterer was all ready to go and said so, and all the people wanted to get up and go eat. And they said, no, 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 you can't eat yet. You have to have the invocation. So they called up the uh, old-timer, and the old-timer got up to read this invocation. And the first word on the thing was God. And he said, God. And they all recited the serenity prayer and got up and ran. And they, <laughs> they, uh, 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 so I guess the only moral to that story is if uh, you're ever asked to give an invocation, don't break God into it too soon. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad Max was here. I'm glad you let her share. Uh, I have to say that. Uh, the, uh, yeah. See, now, I, I love Al-Anon. In fact, I go to Al-Anon uh, every Monday tomorrow. Tomorrow noon, we'll be going to me. In fact, I'm leaving tomorrow morning, tomorrow noon. If you're all in Laguna tomorrow, uh, stop in, and we'll show you how to lead a good Al-Anon meeting. I go to Al-Anon with Max. Max comes to Al, Al, uh, AA with me, and... Um, we have our two Alla dogs, Lily and Sabrina, and uh, just just like Francine's three Alla cats. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, our dogs come to more meetings than a lot of people that are trying to stay sober. <laughs> and as I often say, they have better personalities than a lot of people that are trying to stay sober. And, uh, I used to. Uh, make fun of the al and um, even though our book says uh, they're not at fault, they seem to have been born that way. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I decided, I decided al jokes are like ethnic jokes. I mean, there's nobody um, more anxious to see us make it than the, the al either as an organization or as individuals. So I don't make fun of them, even though they are rather humorous. Uh, they, <laughs> Max likes to tell the story about how uh, Paula wanted to use uh, our pool for the baptisms. And I thought, gee, how many people do you know have a whole pool full of baptismal water? And I thought, so I, I agreed to it. He said, well, nothing else. I didn't know. And anyway, Max was still annoyed at, at Anne for doing that. And that was Saturday night by the time they got through and all that. And that's the night for us to go to our big Laguna Beach Canyon Club Saturday night meeting where I happened to be secretary at the time. And Max decided she couldn't go to the meeting. She had to stay home and watch. She didn't want to watch them, but she wanted to be there to protect the house or whatever it was. I don't know. It didn't make any sense to me that we had to watch our own daughter and her goofy friends. Uh, and, but So she didn't come to the meeting. Well, I went on to the meeting by myself, and of course, since we always go to meetings together, uh, people were, kept asking me, where's Max, where's Max? And then I was getting tired of people asking me, where's Max, where's Max? And so finally, when I got up to give the announcements as the secretary, I said, Max isn't with me tonight, and everybody keeps asking me, where's Max, where's Max, where's Max? And I'm sick of answering the question, so I'll tell you all. Max got ticked off, and Max is home in bed having an al slip. Yeah, and, 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 and she got so many phone calls, she's never done that again. <laughs> no. Anyhow, I, uh, I, 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 it's interesting that we uh, both like the program as much as we do, and enjoy this way of life as much as we do, because when you stop and think about how I wasn't even an alcoholic when I came here. Uh, <laughs> no, I wasn't. As she said about her uh, alcoholic uncles, and uh, that uh, they, the Gansline boys were well known in our town that, uh, that they were alcoholics. And Max and I, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but at the end of this year, uh, December the 2nd of this year, Max and I will have been married for 54 years. The, uh, and we've been, we've been emotionally involved with each other to very, very, varying in degrees of intensity for, oh, for 70 years. So, 
Wow, that's right. Uh, yeah. The uh, and uh, what I started to say was when we grew up together, and uh, as we were growing up, my family didn't like for me to be playing with the Gensheim girl because the Gensheim boys were alcoholics, and they were afraid that if I we were too involved with each other when we got married, that I would turn out to be an alcoholic. And by God, they were right. Uh, <laughs> The, the, a lot of people don't know how they got to be alcoholic. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm an alcoholic by marriage. The, uh, the, uh, not really very funny. I didn't plan on being an alcoholic. Uh, the, uh, in, fact, in fact, that's how I got to the disease. I ended up, as she said, she drove me to drink for years and then uh, drove me into the nut work. And, and uh, from the only way I could get out of the nut ward was to get a pass to go to AA meetings. And um, I had no intentions of continuing to go to meetings. Uh, and I ended up uh, going to these. I finally got discharged from the hospital. I had no intentions of going back to meetings once I got out. But the point was that Max liked the meetings. And, of course, once I found out she liked them, I used that against her. If she wouldn't shape up, then I'd say, oh, I'm not going to AA anymore. And, well, I did that once too often. And she got in the car, and she can't, she couldn't drive the freeways, but she did it anyway. She got in the car and drove all the way to Laguna Beach by herself. She would down, go down to Laguna Beach. She'd go to the AA meetings by herself. Have you ever tried that? Have you, have you ever tried sitting at home on a Saturday night drinking while your non-alcoholic spouse is off laughing it up at an AA meeting? I found it boring. I, and I wondered what they were laughing about, and uh, I had to go back to find out what they were laughing about, and uh, I found out that alcoholics laugh at anything. <laughs> so, they laugh at things they ought to be ashamed of, for God's sake. <laughs> they didn't laugh at their drinking, for God's sake. And I thought, it was embarrassing, I thought. Uh, my, in fact, what happened to me was, I, one night I found myself laughing with them, and I haven't had a drink since. <laughs> I found out that I found out that my higher power laughs every time it hears alcoholics laugh. Even if he doesn't understand the joke, he laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> he, just, he likes to hear him laugh, and I, I think it uh, has a lot to do with my sobriety. And that um, took me seven months of going to meetings uh, to turn into an alcoholic. Well, that's how I found out that it was uh, it's a contagious disease. Uh, I thought you, I, I had been raised to think that you got alcoholism by drinking alcohol in bars. You don't get alcoholism, you get drunk drinking alcohol, you, but you don't get alcoholism from alcohol. You get it from other alcoholics. It's contagious. And, uh, it's a virus. So, it goes in through your ears. Yeah. <laughs> it affects your brain. See, uh, and, uh, trouble, and you get it from other alcoholics. Uh, and that's why, in fact, if you're here today and, uh, and you don't, you're not really, really, really an alcoholic, you want to be very careful what you listen to. And, and <laughs> anytime you're around alcoholics, be very careful, very careful what you listen to. Keep your mind wide open, wide open, so whatever goes in goes right on through. Uh, <laughs> and you're around alcoholics, and they say something, and you think, my God, I felt something like that when I did something similar. You're supposed to I might be an alcoholic. Boom, you're an alcoholic. <laughs> and, and the bad part is that once you suspect it, it's too late. You've already... <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and you won't get any sympathy from me. You, you turn to one of the next of them and you say, you know, I think I might be an alcoholic. Oh, we got another one. Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you think they got a bonus or a prize on every new member or something. I thought, my God, these people are willing to go to any lengths to get you to join this stupid organization. Yeah. And, uh, uh, in fact, they, they enjoy being alcoholics. In fact, watch it here tonight. Will all the alcoholics please raise your hand? Raise, all the alcoholics. See? My God, the place is crawling with them. Uh, <laughs> I've, always, I've always been impressed with the number of alcoholics that you see at AA meetings. Uh, it's, 
And there was one over here, raised both hands and waved. <laughs> the big, try that at a bar sometime, you know. <laughs> just drop in at a meeting, a bar, it's after, it's after the meeting. Say, I'm, I just, uh, any alcoholics, please raise your hand. I don't think you'll get, I don't think you'll get the same response. Uh, in fact, I don't think there are any alcoholics in the bars. They're all, all the alcoholics are in the meetings. And, uh, and the bad part about it is that uh, once you're uh, uh, even a little bit alcoholic, I was hardly alcoholic at all in the beginning. I, really, I was one I had one one less meeting, and I could have been stayed out there, you know. But I was just when I first yeah, really. It's a, so I went to one meeting too many. And turned into a very, very mild alcoholic. Uh, in fact, I even had words that I knew I wasn't. I was maybe I was uh, allergic to alcohol, but I wasn't a drunkard. I wasn't a skid. Oh, I certainly wasn't a skid row bum. I wasn't a lush. I wasn't a wino. But I was kind of allergic to alcohol. Just, just enough. I had to keep coming back. And the trouble is, I had to keep coming back. And the more I kept coming back, the more alcoholic I became. <laughs> And I'm much, much, much more alcoholic today. Much more alcoholic today. Than, much more alcoholic than I was 26 years ago. 20, 26 years ago. And uh, I, uh, but uh, that's, so it's a, it was a progressive disease when I was drinking, and my disease has progressed since I quit drinking. The nice part about it is the recovery is progressive too. It's been a progressive disease and a progressive recovery. And uh, I, uh, once I became an alcoholic, I decided, you know, I uh, better not drink. Because uh, I noticed in AA, uh, they don't like for you to drink. They don't tell you that, but you can tell. <laughs> and, uh, and I decided I... Uh, I, you know, but I, I, I remember that every time I'd quit drinking, and I'd quit drinking many, many, many times, I'd quit, and every time, every time that I had quit drinking, I ended up drunk. And I thought, now what am I going to do? Here I'm about, I'm going to be an AA, I want to be one of the winners in AA, and I don't see winners who drink, uh, but I, if I quit, I'll get drunk. And, uh, I remember this stupid statement that they make, uh, well, you just don't drink one day at a time. It's one drink for one day. Just don't drink one day at a time. One day at a time. I thought, what the hell good would that do to not drink for one day, you know? I tell that to dummies, but you don't tell that to doctors, for God's sake. Well, I didn't know what else to do. So I decided one day, I'd, I won't tell anybody, but I just won't drink today and see what happens. Nothing happened. Uh, I thought I'd try it another day, and nothing happened that day, and uh, that's the way, kind of way I do it. I drank many yesterday, and I'm going to drink tomorrow, but I don't drink today. In fact, I didn't know if I could keep from drinking today if I didn't know I was going to drink tomorrow. When tomorrow gets here, I check the time, and if it's today, I won't drink today. Yeah. <laughs> And so I had to do a lot of things to keep from drinking uh, and to be reasonably comfortable to not drinking. That's an important part of my sobriety is to not drink is one thing, but I, I, I want more than to just not drink. Abstinence alone is not recovery, but no recovery can take place without abstinence. But I want more. I want more of what this program has to offer, offer than just to not drink. And uh, so I've had to do all kinds of things to get it. A lot of times, I, I, I used to get upset at Max and drink, and I was sure that she, if you had my wife, you'd drink too, was my mother, and she drove me to drink for all this time, and and but now, more recently now in sobriety, I've, uh, a lot of times I'll be upset, and a little voice will say to me, well, is it important? And I'll say, you're damn right it's important, and I want to defend why it's important. And a little voice will say, well, is it worth drinking over? I think, well, hell no, nothing's worth drinking over, for God's sake. 
then the little voice will say, well, if you're not going to reward yourself with a drink, why bother to be so upset? You know? <laughs> you know. you know. I think, well, screw it. You know. <laughs> In fact, I remember the time I called, used to, uh, when I gave up drinking, because back in the days before AA, Max thought I was her problem, and I was sure she was my problem. And she was working on me to get me straightened out, and I was working on her to get her straightened out. So that we were, at, uh, and the harder we worked on each other, the worse it got. And so today we've had to reverse that, and we work on ourselves instead of on each other. And uh, I remember when I first got sober, I wasn't going to drink, but she didn't shape up the minute I quit drinking, and she was hard to live with, and I thought people ought to know. <laughs> That's right. I mean, why, if you're going to put up with all this crap, I mean, somebody ought to know, by God, what it is. You have to, when you're in the victim role, you've got to let people know it. Or they, might, they might expect you to do all the things that other people do. And... Uh, I thought that's what sponsors were for. And I used to call my sponsor up and tell him about the things she did. And one day she did something really particularly difficult uh, that I can't recall at the moment. Uh, <laughs> the, and I called my sponsor up and I started to tell him what she had done. And I don't know whether I called him many, one time too often or on a bad day or what it was. I'd hardly even got started and he interrupted me. And he says, he says, why don't you put it out of your mind a couple of days and see what happens? I, I said, yeah, a couple of days? I'll forget all about it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, actually, actually, that's typical of problems. I, I, I've always... Uh, I have more trouble. I have more problems with problems. Problems have a, a very high infant mortality. <laughs> you, you can't ignore your problems for hardly any time at all. I mean, I, you just have to stay right there with them. I mean, it's uh, it, 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 have you ever had a problem that you worked on so hard and it was just uh, just a delicate, beautiful problem that you really developed it. <laughs> And, it, and somebody will say to you, well, this meeting tonight, you're going to be there? And you go, oh, no, I can't come to the meeting. I've got to stay and work on this problem. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know that if you go off and waste the whole evening on that meeting, it, by the time you get back, that problem is liable to be wielded to the point where you can't even bring it back, you know. <laughs> You can't, you can't neglect your problems. It, uh, that's why the telephone is so important for me. I'm, I'll be working on a problem, and the phone will ring, and somebody will be calling me with some stupid little problem. They ought to be able to take care of themselves. And, and, but you can't give them an answer real quick. You've got to be actively interested in them. You have to ask questions. and see, That's active listening. That's the, that's the in thing today, to be active listening. You see. Yes, things like, well, then what did you do then? Oh, and then how did you feel about that? <laughs> oh, and then, oh, and then what happened? You know, you ask them question after question until neither one of you can stand it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then you give them the answer, you know. And, What's the answer? You pick a number from one to twelve. And say, they work that step, you know. Yeah. They come back and say, "Oh, I have the most wonderful sponsor," you know. Unless you picked four or five, I mean, in which case they don't come back. Uh, but you don't want you don't want to sponsor people who don't want to do the steps anyhow. What that's what it's all about. It's nice to. In fact, uh, I see Jim sitting here. Jim and Sandy. Jim's part of our uh, the group of twelve that we get together. And we're uh, what happened was uh, I got some uh, questionnaires from uh, Texas, where down there several people would get together and form a. It's not a group, an AA group, but just a meeting, and they would. Um, agree to meet every week at the same time for the 20 weeks that it would take 
and nobody would drop out, and they wouldn't have other people join in, and they would always do the assignment in the book before the meeting, and when they got to the meeting, they'd go over the part of the book again, and they would study the first 164 pages of the book, and when they came to a step, they would do it, so that it was a step do it, not a step study. <laughs> and and uh, they didn't share fifth steps, but they shared the experience of having, doing their fourth and fifth step, and so on. And uh, so I got that, and uh, there were a lot of typos, and some of it was hard to read, and so on. I made that into a pamphlet, and I give those out. This is my, uh, Francine does all kinds of service with a capital S. I do a little service with a small s. This is my kind of service where I distribute the pamphlet free, and then if people want to pay for mailing and uh, postage or printing, and mailing, then I make it available. And we get it grouped together, and people will and do the steps. The point I wanted to make was, that this is my 26th year, and I uh, this will be my fifth time to do this, to re really do all the steps. And every time I've done it so far, it's, it's raised me to a new plateau in sobriety, just like the first time I did the steps. Now, I know there are people who say you do the steps once, you never do them again, you just do the maintenance steps. And there are people, I think the people who do it once would never do it again. Uh, they just do the maintenance steps, also just do it once and just do the maintenance steps. And there are other people who want to do the steps over every year, and if you want to do that, that's fine. I'm not telling anybody what they should do, I'm just saying what I do and what has been working for me. And it's been a real interesting uh, experience. I, I like that, and I appreciate Jim doing that with me. And uh, so where there that is, where's that in now? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. Oh, another thing about the telephone. We, I have, whenever I think about it, I give out our phone number. We live in the 714 area. In fact, everybody in our county lives in the 714 area. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and our number is 240-3940. And we spend a lot of time on the phone. A lot of people call. And when, it's interesting. When people call, they're calling from the middle of their problem. But when they reach me, I'm in the answer. And it makes it entirely different. It's real interesting to deal with things. And people talk freely over the phone and that. So the call anytime you're it's interesting because I I'm often working on a problem and I need that phone to ring. And, yeah. I've always because I've always believed in the positive power of worry. But I always thought that if you worry enough about a problem that's coming, if you put up a, a lot of worry you can put up like a plastic shield that'll protect you from the worry the problem getting to you. And uh if it gets to you anyway, it gets over the shield, at least you know you gave it your best shot by God. Because you know? uh, if you don't worry and it hits you, then you have to worry, you have to feel guilty for not even trying. <laughs> and, anyhow, all the things that I do, having spots, going to meetings, lots of meetings, and working steps and working with others and all this stuff, I find it easy to not take a drink today. That's not even an option for me today. It's not. I've made a commitment to uh, being a successful member of AA. Uh, I like that word commitment. I talking to a fellow the other day, but in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, never any length of sobriety on uh, alcohol and cocaine and other drugs. And I said, a young guy. And I said, gee, you're a young guy. A year out of your life would mean nothing. Why don't you make a commitment to total sobriety, the best kind of sobriety you can get, in AA for one year. Just come to AA and be the most committed AA member you can be for one year. Stay sober, get your cake, celebrate your birthday, and that night sit down with yourself and decide whether you like that year better than the years before, or you want more of that or more of what you had had. And he's been doing that now. It's been just over six, uh, six months. And he's just doing it working out real well for him. I had... Uh, the word commitment is, has even meaning has meaning to me. Howard P. down in our area uh, talks about it. Uh, he he mentioned that when when you make a commitment, that providence moves too. That when you make a commitment to something, providence moves in, and all sorts of things happen that wouldn't otherwise have happened in the absence of the commitment. And uh, I feel com I'm committed to AA, and I find that it gives me a sense of drive, a sense of goal, and a way to go. And uh, it, it means that keeping from drinking and drugging is uh, is easy for me. And uh, 
Max mentioned I took pills. I thought, well, this is an AA meeting. We don't talk about pills. Uh, uh, but and uh, and, uh, and I think that's fine. But uh, I do feel I need to at least give some brief, brief honorable mention to amphetamines. Uh, <laughs> Why, have you used amphetamines? <laughs> I never would have guessed. Uh, uh, but I never got hooked on Yeah. I, she made it sound that way, but I didn't. I, I never got hooked. I mean, I, I don't know that I would have had the stamina to have completed my pre-AA training period if it hadn't been for the amphetamines, but I never got hooked on <laughs> I never got hooked on them. You can't get hooked on them. I ask any doctor, you can't get hooked on pills. You can't get, first place he'll tell you, none of his patients ever get hooked on pills. But you can't get hooked on pills unless you abuse them. It's true. You have to abuse the pill in order to get hooked on it. And I never abused a pill in my life. I, I don't even know how to abuse the pill. How do you abuse the pill? Throw it up against the wall? You know, you, you, you stomp on the thing or... Verbally abuse it, you dirty, rotten little pill, aren't you doing it? I never, I never abused a pill. I mean, there were tiny little pills. I mean, you could tell the look at them. They were very mild. And they just, I was even very careful where I carried my pills. So look, the little pocket inside the big pocket, that's the pill pocket. That's where you keep your pills. And it's a, you, yeah, I used to carry, for a start out, I carry more of my change. People say, you got change for a dollar? I say, yeah, and I go like that. And they say, oh, you carry second all around in the daytime, you know. So I switched them over with my keys, and then I'd go out to get in the car, and I'd take the keys out of my pocket, and a quaalude run down the street. And, Damn thing would always run faster than I could run. You know, you, and I didn't dare stomp on it or abuse it. You know, the, uh, the, uh, I, uh, uh, I never abused Bill in my life. In fact, I never, I never ever took a pill. I never ever took a pill. It wasn't medically indicated at the time. I had the symptom. I had the symptom that only that pill would relieve. It was, I either had it or I could feel it coming on. And they, uh, <laughs> and every pill was taken according to directions and prescribed by a doctor. The, uh, and uh, anyhow, I uh, my problem today. My problems today are not related to drinking. I didn't, haven't had a problem as a result of drinking since the last time I took a drink. Uh, my problems today are all related to my thinking. In fact, I don't even have a problem today, unless I think I do. <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. I have never ever thought I had a problem and been wrong. If I think I have a problem, I have a problem. If I think it's a big problem, it's a big problem, no matter what anybody else thinks. If I think it's a little problem, just a little problem, no matter what. Anybody. Don't have many little problems. I don't bother with them. It's like resentments. I don't bother with any but the justifiable ones. Yeah. I shouldn't tell this story. It's not my story, but it's uh, not even a story. It's a true fact. I was, uh, I was reading uh, David Biscott, David Biscott, the psychiatrist on TV, radio, books. I was looking through one of his books, uh, he has several books. It's one of his books on emotional problems and how you deal with them. And I was leafing through it, and he had a thing on resentment. And I thought, well, he can't tell us anything about resentment. But I'll see what he has to say anyway after reading through the thing. He says, you have resentment against somebody, you write your name on a piece of paper. I thought, okay, I'll write it. Write it in bold letters, he says. Okay, I'll write it in bold letters. Then he says, you tear it up. I thought, okay, I'll tear it up. He said, you tear it up vigorously. I'll tear it up vigorously. 
And he says, you throw it in the toilet. Said, okay, I'll throw it in the toilet. And he says, then you use the toilet. See? <laughs> I thought, how, how can we combine something as crude as that, that with our program of praying for the person? And then a little voice in my head says, well, you could pray for the SOB while you're using the toilet. The, uh, the, uh. In fact, that's what my life consists of, people in my head talking, 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 people. Anytime I'm thinking, somebody's talking, 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 talking. I say, when I, as long as I'm awake, somebody's talking. Even when I'm asleep, they're talking, talking, talking. A lot of times in the morning, I wake up and I, my mood is set by what they've been telling me. And I, I don't even remember what they were telling me, but I just have the mood. That's why I needed early morning meetings seven days a week, in order to, because my day could be ruined. It hadn't even started yet. And uh, I couldn't wait till night to get straightened out. A, a, a is attitude to uh, or attitude adjustment, and AA is altered attitude is what I was trying to say. And But I had to have it in the morning as well as at night. But my life consists of the voices talking to me all the time, talking, talking to me. In fact, even now, it's uh, like this room. You're sitting here very quietly, and there are people in my head. They're up there, and they're talking. They're talking, talking, talking. Yeah, yeah. And I'm trying to keep my focus on what I'm saying to you, but they're talking, talking, talking. And, and not only that, they get to discussing among themselves what I ought to be talking about. And they say, no, don't have them talk about that. Talk about this. And I start talking about this. And they want to talk about that. And my mind gets kind of, my God, why don't you shut up up there? You know. They, and they, they all get startled and shut up, and I can't think of anything to say. And they, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it isn't. It isn't my life. It isn't what happens in my life that determines my life. It's what they think about what happens. And it's their comments about what happens. It's, it, it, my whole life is revolves around them up there, and, the, it, and there are all these people up there. And each one has their own single pet focus. And the, ho 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 ho! Yourself. Uh, they, uh, they, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for, in, for instance, there's one of them up there. There's one of them up there who is obsessed with Max. He always has been. As long as he's known her, and you know, we've known her, he's, he's been obsessed with her and what she does and how she does it. And he doesn't particularly like her. <laughs> And he's, he loves to point out to me, did you hear what she just said? <laughs> did you notice her tone of voice? <laughs> Does she know who she's talking to? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yet, there's another one up there, the same obsession the same obsession with Mac, but he likes Mac. He does. And he loves to point out things like, doesn't she have a great sense of humor? Aren't you lucky you have her? You know, isn't it great that she kept going to AA when you didn't want to go? Isn't it great that she's so active in Al-Anon? Doesn't she have a great spiritual program? You know, that, so in my life, my marriage, my life, my marriage, depends on who I listen to. I didn't know I had a choice. In fact, when you don't know you have a choice, you don't have a choice. But my life depends on who I listen to up there. There are people up there that tell me what a great day it is. And there are people up there that tell me what a crappy day this is. Yeah. In fact, in fact, I, I'm convinced in the uh, the law of appreciation. Keep looking at my watch because we promised the end at 1.30 if you're beginning to wonder what time this is going to be over. But I, 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 I become very interested in the, in the law. It's called the law of appreciation. The law of appreciation says that in this life, every person, place, thing, situation, institution, corporation, or any combination thereof has both good and bad in it. That's just the way it is. 
That's just the way it is. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it always will be. If there's a place called heaven, maybe up there everything would be 100% good. If there's a place called hell, maybe everything would be 100% bad. But where we are, it's both good and bad. And our choice is, whether it's a choice or not, what we do is we either look at the good or look at the bad. The, the, the important point is that when I look at the good, it keeps getting gooder. And when I look at the bad, it keeps getting badder. My mind is like an energy factory. It puts energy into whatever I think about. That's why gratitude lists work for me. No matter what time of day I'm having, if I start, if my sponsor says make a gratitude list, I start making out the things I have to be grateful for, I end up feeling grateful. But that's where I put my focus. That's why I can have a bad day and I can go to a meeting, and even if it isn't what you'd call a good meeting, I can end up feeling better when I leave. It's because I've been living in the problem. I go to the meeting. I'm living in the answer. In fact, my mind was distracted as I said something about going to a meeting. It wasn't a good meeting. I have an old timer in my morning meeting. He said the other day, he says, I've never been to a bad meeting. I thought, oh, God. <laughs> he says, no, he says, I've never been to a bad meeting, but I sure have been to some long ones. <laughs> <laughs> but but my I need to keep my focus on how, either how good things are or how bad things are, and I, uh, I, I my day is created by what I fo keep my focus on and what the people. It isn't what happens to me; it's what I think about what happens uh, that determines my life today. And if I, in fact, the more I uh, think in terms of spiritual things, the more spiritual I become. The more I think in terms of loving things, the more loving I become. I was talking about AA or by now call this and being a um, contagious disease, a virus. What I, I like to think of an alcoholic or other chemically dependent person as being a person who, whether they want to or not, and perhaps even more so if they don't want to, but whether they want to or not, they generate a great deal of love and lack the ability to express love. Now, if you generate love and you lack the ability to express it, that's an emotion and it keeps building up inside and creating uh, discomfort. They put in alcohol and drugs to suppress those feelings. seems to help. But because it compounds the communication problem, it makes it worse. Not only does it get worse, but not only can the alcoholic not express love, he can't receive it. So that those who, who love us can't express their love either. And, but it keeps building up, and it can't express it. Can't come out as love. Has to come out some way. So it comes out as negative emotions. Frustration, resentment, anger, hostility, violence. All of which compound the communication problem. So it's a progressive disease. It keeps getting progressively worse. No answer to that. Can't go to a doctor and just give you pills. You've already tried those. Yeah. End up, what happens to people like that? They end up as a newcomer in AA or l -Nan. What do we do with newcomers? Seems to me we love the hell out of them. We love the hell out of their hellish lives. We don't even call it that, but we, we demonstrate it. We demonstrate love. We tell them, well, look, at, look at, uh, at the countdowns. Look how, uh, weren't those countdowns great last night and Friday night? Uh, and how we show the newcomer how important they are to us. Because as I see it, they're very important to us. We'd die without them. As I, as I see it, a, a, alcoholism is a disease, a medical problem. That's one. Two, we have a spiritual answer to that medical problem. And three, part of that spiritual answer is we have to give it away to keep it. We don't give it away. We can't keep it. So we need the newcomers. There's no risk involved because they're making them faster than we're curing them. And the thing is that it's uh, uh, showing them. That's a, that's a loving thing to make the other person feel important. In fact, we do that at meetings. As I see it, that's what a meeting's all about. We're talking about meetings of whether you go to meetings because you have to or go to meetings because you want to. You go there for what you can get out of it or do you go there for what you can give to it? 
And it seems to me it's a, an act of love just to just to sit in a meeting. Just to sit silently. Because you're doing that now. You've got lots of other things you could be doing right now. But you're sitting at a meeting listening to an alcoholic uh, stand up here and talk. That's a very loving thing to do. To just sit quietly and pretend like you're interested and pretend like you care. <laughs> and, and whether you are or not. And it's also, as was I think Francine mentioned last night, coming up at the podium and sharing and talking and spilling your guts and taking the risk or what seems like a risk of being honest. And that it's a, an act of love to get up here. It's an act of love to be down there. And we take turns back and forth doing that. And we, I think we just love each other to help. We love each other to help. And it seems to me we can take that same act of love or that same... Uh, Willingness to make the other person feel important, we can take that home. We can take that communication skills that we learn here home. Uh, I was reading something, uh, reading about David and Vera Mace, husband and wife, both of whom were marriage, family, child counselors, had been for 50 years. For 25 years, they worked uh, with marriages and relationships in, in trouble. And for 25 years, they worked in uh, what they called marriage enrichment. There were relationships that were doing well, but wanted to do even better. They thought this is a wonderful opportunity to see why some relationships work out and some don't. They looked to see what problems the relationships that broke up, what problems they had, what broke up the relationship. And they found out they were like sex, kids, in-laws, money. They looked at the marriages, the relationships that were doing well, to see if they had problems, and they found out that their problems were sex, money, in-laws, you know, kids, you know, same deal. But so that the problems weren't what caused the thing to break up. They checked in it further, and after 50 years of study, they came to the conclusion that the relationships that did well had three things that the others that had did not, that they lacked. And to paraphrase what they, they found out, it, they said, one, that the relationships that uh, did well had a mutual concern for the partner's spiritual and emotional growth. A mutual willingness to learn and to practice communication skills. And a mutual interest in dealing with problems creatively. In other words, it had to do with an interest in your other, your partner's growth, spiritual and emotional, an interest in learning and practicing communication skills, and an interest in dealing with problems creatively. I thought that is a tremendously big order. Who could ever do all that? But the more I think about it, that's the AAL non-problem program. That's what we do. We're interested in each other's spiritual and emotional growth, and we're interested in dealing with things, communi learning communication, and with dealing with problems uh, Creatively, if you're not going to drink over a problem, you got to find an answer to it. If you're not going to break up, that's one of the things Max and I decided a long time ago. It doesn't necessarily work for anybody else, but it does for us. But we uh, decided we were not going to divorce. And if you're not going to drink over it, you're not going to leave over it. Hell, you're stuck. You've got to think of a. <laughs> you have to think of an answer, otherwise you're feeling miserable all the time. I let me uh, say this, um, Father Bar. Uh, let me. I was thinking of a graph of my life. And my life started way, way over there, and it's going to end way, way, way over there. And from where it started until July 31st, 1967, it was on a downhill course. It wasn't a straight line down. It was up and down, up and down. But it could, and I think I would have recognized it sooner. I don't know if I'd have been able to do anything about it, but I would have recognized it sooner. But it, was a, 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 it wasn't a straight line down. It was up and down. And it just kept getting worse and worse until I ended up in the nut ward of the hospital I was on the staff of. Uh, and that wasn't bad enough. I had to go to AA. And after seven months of AA, I turned into a mild alcoholic. And my life has been getting better and better and better ever since. And it's been getting just better and better. Now, it's, again, it's not a straight line. It's up and down, up and down. When I first would go down, pain feels like pain. And I think, my God, there's no use being sober. This is just as bad as it was. But I realized that it's not as bad. And if I, there are all kinds of things I can do to get over the pain. And the only things, uh, uh, there are a lot of things I can do so I'll feel better in the pain now that I didn't know back then. Plus the fact that I don't even have to do anything and I know it'll get better. 
But that's the only Bible quote I use. The Bible doesn't say, and it came to stay. The Bible says, and it came to pass. And, 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 and I just keep going to meetings. We're going to stop going my sponsor and reading the book. It'll pass, and it'll get better. And, and, and it's not always the same. Now, some days are better, some weeks are better, some months are better, some years are better than others. And, uh, uh, and, but and, and the trend is better. And it seems to me the only limit as to how good it can get for me is how long I can stay around doing what I'm doing. And I'm going to keep doing it and see what happens. And uh, it's, it amazes me how, what was the cause of that V, the shape? What, what caused the change in direction of that? And it all seems to come back to the fact that I accepted. I accepted the fact that I, of all people, strange as it might seem, am a mild alcoholic. It was, and, 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 and I look back, the more I resisted being an alcoholic, the worse it got. And the more I accept it, the better it gets. It's the same with the marriage. If I resist the marriage, it gets worse. If I accept it as it is, it gets better. And it seems to me that's true of everything about life. The more I resist it, life seems to love the challenge. If I say, I don't like it the way it is, and I'm not going to accept it until it gets better, it keeps getting worse. And when I accept the way it is, and uh, it seems it gets better and better. Uh, and it doesn't have anything to do with approval, as Max said. Um, approval doesn't precede acceptance. It follows it. And if I, out in the real world, if you don't approve of something, you don't accept it. You're a wimp if you do. Uh, but in God's world, it has nothing to do with acceptance. And uh, I just, I don't know, as far as I know, God doesn't even have an 800 customer relations number. Uh, uh, I can't imagine one of, the angel, one of his angels running up to God and saying, Oh, God, God, we got a problem. Paul doesn't like the day he was sending me. I can just imagine him saying, Well, you can tell him where to go. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think it's time for me to go. Thank you all very much. I love you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.